Good evening, friends. Sorry. Good evening, friends. Hi, Chris. Hey, Bill's awake. Thank you. That man has a voice for radio, I tell you. Uh, friends, it's great to see you at church tonight. My name is Chris. I'm the Church at 630 Minister. Uh, a very special welcome. I hope you're enjoying your time with us. If you could keep Acts chapter 3 open in front of you, we're going to spend some time thinking about what this means for us today. You see, as Chris has already helpfully said, so I'll just find Acts. As Chris has helpfully said, we're finishing our short series in the book of Acts tonight. Acts chapter 3 and 4 go together uh, as, a, uh, as a unit. That is, uh, Acts chapter 4 is events that closely follow and are the result of the, acts of the, the events of chapter 3. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4 tonight. Um, and so what I'm going to need you to do is keep your Bibles open in front of you. Um, all the, the verses that are in chapter 3 uh, will be in 3, then we'll jump into a little bit of chapter 4, and there'll be a few more verses on the slides next to us. Uh, these couple of weeks have been a great opportunity for us to be reminded of the mission of Jesus and that God's mission continues on earth today and that we have a part to play. That as Jesus filled his disciples with his spirit and sent them with his saving message to the ends of the earth, he fills all believers with his spirit and calls us to do the same. To take the message of Jesus to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth like places like Orange. Uh, last week we saw Peter boldly tell people about Jesus and 3,000 people believed. And so far, it looks like nothing can get in the way of the disciples. I mean, uh, they just get, the balls just keep lobbing up and they hit home runs. People, by their thousands, are turning to trust in Jesus until tonight. You see, in chapter 3, uh, sorry, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested for what they're doing for boldly proclaiming the truth about Jesus. And then in chapter 4, they're, they're put on trial for what they've been, say, they've been saying. The thing that really stands out in chapters 3 and 4 is chapter 4, verse 19. So if you've got your Bibles there, have a look at chapter 4, verse 19. In front of the, in front of the jury, Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So tonight I want to ask the question, how can you keep speaking about Jesus when people don't want to listen? How can you keep speaking about Jesus when people don't want to listen? A number of years ago, I was helping my brother move. We were driving between his old place and his new place. And so being the polite brother he is, he asked me how church is going. I thought, great, this is an opportunity for me to tell him about Jesus. I said, church is going great. Last week, we looked at one of the Gospels, you know, the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. And we were reminded that Jesus forgives our sin by nothing that we do and only by his death, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you know what my brother said? Absolutely nothing. Like complete dead silence for half an hour. After that, he turned to me and said, well, that killed the conversation, didn't it? Has that ever happened to you? Whether it's you're sharing your life or your faith, or even telling someone that you love about the good news of Jesus. Uh, people um, don't really want to hear that kind of stuff. Maybe it's a response of silence, or maybe it's even hostility. A dear friend of mine, a guy called Graham, went to Christmas lunch at his brother-in-law's house. They were going around the table at lunchtime sharing what they did that morning, and Graham said, well, we went to church, and we were reminded that at Christmas time, Jesus is God's gift, the birth of a saviour. And in front of his whole family, Graham's brother-in-law stood up and said, thank you, that's enough. If you mention Jesus one more time, I'm going to ask you to leave. 
has something like that happened to you? You see, whether it's the awkward silence or something is confronting that was what happened to my mate Graham, many of us will have had different experiences of people who don't want to listen about Jesus. So tonight, how do you keep speaking about Jesus when people don't want to listen? How do we keep being on Jesus' mission together when people don't want to hear the good news? How about I quickly pray for us? Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that it contains uh, the words of eternal life. We thank you for um, the example of um, Peter and John and the other disciples and the early church. And we pray that you would help us to learn from their example, Lord. That you by your spirit will give us great boldness and courage and confidence so that we can't help but tell people your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in chapter 3 tonight, and chapter 3 begins with Peter and John, and they're going to the temple to pray. As they're walking along, they meet a beggar who's asking for money, and they they don't give him money. Instead, verse 6, they say, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And then something extraordinary happens. You see, muscles tendons and sinews grow and reform. Legs are strengthened. A man who probably never learned to walk, he walks, he leaps, he praises God. The risen Lord Jesus is at work through his spirit-empowered disciples. And their ministry is a continuation of Jesus' ministry. So just as Jesus uses signs to call people to repentance and faith, Peter does the same thing. He uses this opportunity to call a crowd of people in the temple to trust in Jesus. Have a look at verse 13 with me. Peter says this, The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You see, Peter is in the temple speaking to fellow Israelites, and so he shares a very Jewish gospel. He mentions a bunch of words that that would relate to the people who are listening. So he talks about God being the God of Abraham, the God of our ancestors. He then goes on to talk about Jesus as being the holy and righteous one. But in particular, it's the word servant that Peter wants his crowd to see. That's because 500 years before Jesus, God promised through the prophet Isaiah that God would send his servant into the world. He said this, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, that's the servant, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. You see, see, Peter's crowd in the temple are devout Jewish people, and so they would know God's promises, particularly this promise that God gave to the prophet Isaiah that God promised to take away the frailty and failures of God's people and bring them to peace. And that they would know that God's servant will achieve these things by bearing their sins in his body. That God's innocent servant would stand in their place and receive shame and disgrace and rejection and ultimately death the death that God's people deserved. Uh, And if you were to go home and to read Isaiah 52 and 53 tonight, you would see that it's all talking about things that point us to Jesus Christ. And Peter says to the crowd, this is what you did to God's Messiah. So verse 13, he says, you handed him over. Verse 14, you denied him. Have a look at verse 15 with me. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. And by faith in his name, his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus 
has given him this perfect health in front of you all. So just as Isaiah promised that God would raise his servant from the dead, Peter says, verse 15, we are witnesses to this. Peter is saying that we together, both him and the crowd, witness to the resurrection because they see the power of Jesus at work in front of them. You see, this healing is a sign that Jesus is alive and still at work on earth. And just as Jesus healed people so that he could talk about repentance and faith, Peter uses this sign to call the crowd to repentance and faith. Have a look at verse 19. Therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, who's been appointed to you as the Messiah. So in light of this truth, in light of this uncomfortable reality, in the light of their sin and their guilt before God, he calls them to repent, to turn back to God. Peter pleads with the crowd that because of the resurrection of Jesus and that this man um, has been healed through faith in his name, that they can return to God by having faith in Jesus' name. He calls them to return, so to respond to the mercy of Jesus. You see, for this crowd in the temple, it's like they've caught a train, but they've missed their stop. When I was in Bible college, I used to catch a train um, home every day, and occasionally I would fall asleep, which is perfectly fine, right? As long as I woke up in time to change trains at a station called Blacktown. You see, if I didn't change trains at Blacktown, I would end up in Penrith. That's the furthest station on the right. Because what I needed to go to was Richmond, which is the furthest station kind of up in that top right corner. And one night, I didn't wake up in time. I was supposed to be in Richmond, but ended up in Penrith. Uh, my wife Mel called me and she said, where are you? I'm supposed to be picking you up at the station. I said, I'm in Penrith, an hour's drive away. And she said, well, I'll see you when you get home. <laughs> uh, so I jumped on the train, and because, you know, it wasn't as the crow flies, it was actually an hour and a half. You see, what I needed to do was to wake up, to see the signs and to change trains. And Peter is urging the crowd to do the same. He's saying, wake up and see the sign in front of you. Change your direction and return to God. So friends, please do not miss what God is saying to us in his word tonight. If you are someone who has been investigating about whether Jesus is someone worth following, if you're someone who has been putting off turning to Jesus for the first time, or if you're someone who has been living your life without God in the picture, friends, can I plead with you tonight? to pull the emergency brake cord on the train of your life, to get off at the station and to change directions, to turn back to God and to repent of your sin so that you may be forgiven of your sin and have eternal life. So what is the response to Peter's sermon? As Peter so clearly shares this gospel, if we jump back into Acts chapter 3, well, grab your Bible and have a look at uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. While they were speaking, the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple police and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and took them into custody until the next day since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So two responses. The number of believers grew to 5,000 people of that day. Hundreds of people heard Peter preach. They saw, uh, they heard him, they saw the sign, they, they heard the warning, and the Holy Spirit convicted of their heart and they turned and believed. 
They repented and they put their trust in Jesus. Up to 5,000 people were added to the kingdom that day. Praise God. But, sadly, the priests, the captains of the guard and the Sadducees, they didn't like the idea of the resurrection. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're so sad, you see. Um, sorry, dad joke. Uh, and so instead, they throw Peter and John into jail. Which brings us to our next point, persecution. I guess the big question is why? I mean, why are Peter and John treated so harshly if they have such good news for people to hear? I think to understand why they're arrested, why they're opposed, why they face persecution, to understand that we need to go back to Luke's first volume, that is, his gospel. You see, in chapter 12 and chapter 1, Jesus warns his disciples. Um, we're just going to look at chapter 21 tonight. I'll read this out. This is Jesus speaking. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you, speaking about his disciples. They will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to bear witness. Therefore, make up in your minds not to prepare your defence ahead of time, for I will give you such words and a wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You see, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he warned his disciples of what they would face in the future. As he sent them out of Jerusalem with his uh, mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, they will face opposition. They will face persecution. They will be brought before kings and governors and they will be called to give a response. But Jesus calls them not to fear when this happens uh, for two reasons. First, they're not to fear that they will lose eternity. You see, if they um, are brought before the, if they're arrested and before, brought before these people, if they go on speaking about Jesus, they will lose belongings. They will lose relationships. They might even lose their life, but they will never lose their salvation. So they're not to be afraid that persecution would put their eternal salvation at risk. But second, they shouldn't fear because the Holy Spirit will give them words to say. That Jesus, by his, by his Spirit, will give them answers to questions, will give them words to speak and the courage to say them. So they don't need to be afraid of speaking. You see, those who trust Jesus and follow, um, and follow him will follow in his footsteps. And as the disciples' ministry follows the ministry of Jesus, they will face the same opposition that Jesus faced as well. So if we jump back into Acts chapter 4, uh, Peter and John are kept overnight in prison. Uh, the next day, they're brought before a court in trial. Um, have a look at who Luke is careful to mention is at this trial. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 5. The next day, the rulers and elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they, they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, by what power or in what name have you done this? Friends, this, this scene looks awfully familiar, doesn't it? I mean, where else have we seen Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin judging people and asking them by what authority or what name they're doing? It's Jesus, isn't it? This should jog our memory. You see, Jesus stood before Annas and Caiaphas. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin and was asked to give an account of what he'd been doing. And what happened to Jesus? He was handed over to the Romans and executed. And so the great fear is that this would happen to them, that they could suffer the same fate. So this might feel like a kangaroo court, but there is a very real threat of death 
here. So what do Peter and John do? Well, have a look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if you are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. Remember Jesus' words in Luke 21? Not to fear when you get brought in front of the governors and the rulers. Those who oppose Jesus will oppose you as well. You see, they're brought before these rulers in, in, in the Sanhedrin. And just as Jesus promised that he will give them the words to say by his spirit, Peter is filled with the spirit. And he boldly proclaims how this man was healed that it was in the name of Jesus. You see, that's because the, this sign, Peter then says, is evidence. This sign is evidence that Jesus has been raised from the dead. How do you know that Jesus is alive? How do you know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father? Because he's still at work today, and he has made this man well in perfect health. So have a look at how they respond. There's this back and forth, and we, we don't have time to kind of get into the, the nitty-gritty of that, but have a look at this. Verse 16, they say that they, they discuss amongst themselves, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them. Clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that this doesn't spread any further, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in his name. In verse 13, the first sign is the boldness of Peter and John. The second is that they're uneducated. And the third, the most undeniable sign that you should listen to Peter and John is that this man is healed. You see, even though they have the evidence in front of them, it hasn't even dawned on these leaders to accept the evidence. They refuse to admit their fault and they say they're wrong. It hasn't entered their minds because it hasn't entered their hearts. You see, they don't refuse to believe Jesus because of a lack of evidence. They refuse to believe because of their hard heart. And just like they silenced Jesus, they threaten to silence the disciples as well. But what do the disciples do? Verse 19, Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. I've got a question for you. Turn to the person next to you. You know I love these questions. What do Peter and John mean? What do Peter and John mean when they say um, uh, that they are unable to stop speaking about what they've seen and heard? I'll give you a minute. Go. Okay, that's your minute. Please keep those conversations going um, uh, after church, uh, over supper. Um, I wonder what you said. It's, what's really interesting is that they recognise the leaders have power. Did you notice that? They don't reject um, but acknowledge the human leaders. But then they look to a greater authority, that is God. Remember Acts 1 verse 8? You see, their commissioning was from Jesus himself. 
God's king, to, to take the gospel to Jerusalem or Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so they are to obey him. And I bet that they knew that obeying God was going against these institutions. In, I take it that, that they were ready for punishment. Because here they are counting the cost. They are counting the cost for speaking about Jesus and they say, see that he is worthy of it. That he is worthy of any punishment they may receive, any threats that they might have, anything else that they might lose. Jesus is worth speaking about. Why? Have a look at Acts 4 verse 12. Acts 4 verse 12, they say... There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. See, they can't help t telling people about Jesus because they know that Jesus is the only way to true life, to real hope, to lasting peace and eternal life. And so they can't help but tell other people about him. And so in an act of obedience... They keep telling people about Jesus, even though people don't want to listen about, to Jesus. And you see, 2,000 years later, nothing much has changed, has it? You, still, you see, there's still the same need for people to hear about Jesus. There's still the same refusal to weigh up the evidence. And hard hearts to the gospel are still found in people that we know and love and if Jesus is the only name by which people can be saved, then out of love, we must keep telling people about Jesus so they may be saved. Because I take it the temptation is for us to change the message, to, to, to water it down, to, to speak about love more and not so much repentance, to speak about Jesus being our saviour and not so much our Lord, to talk about all the things that God gives us, and not the hard things of following Jesus. You see, Brett McAlp uh, Stephen McAlpine, in his book, put it this way. Uh, he talked about, in his book, The Bad Guys, he talked about Christians being the bad guys today, and he said the only way to stop being a bad guy in the eyes of the world is to become what the world says is a good guy. And right now, that means compromising the Bible. It's amazing that Peter and John refused to compromise the gospel truth, the words that come from Jesus. They refused to stop speaking because it is only by the name of Jesus that people can be saved. And there's that encouragement for us too, to not compromise his word but keep speaking the truth. I guess the question is, then how do we keep speaking about Jesus when people don't want to listen? How do we keep being bold for Jesus today when people don't want to hear about him? In our, the last section of chapter 4, the, um, the disciples go back and they pray together. And so I thought we could finish by reading uh, what they pray and learn from them. So have a look at verse 23, chapter 4, verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And you said that through your Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father, of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth Take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. See, after Peter and John return from their trial, they go to back to God's people. They go back to the church and they pray. They pray, Master, Sovereign Lord, and quote Psalm 2. See, Psalm 2 is a prayer by King David about how the nations rage against Israel's Messiah and how God will ultimately overcome their rebellion because, G because he is God's king. And the disciples liken this to Jesus. That is, Jesus faced hostility and opposition as well. And verse 27, the rulers of this earth opposed Jesus. They arrested Jesus. They flogged and killed Jesus. 
But God ultimately overcame their rebellion because God raised Jesus from the dead. He now sits at God's hand, ruling and reigning as the risen Lord, which means God fulfilled his plan when they opposed Jesus. Then God will fulfill his plan when they opposed the disciples. Did you get that? God fulfilled his plan when they opposed Jesus. And God will fulfill his plan when they oppose the disciples. You see, prayer to a sovereign God restores our perspective. And in face of opposition, it's great comfort. See, when people reject the gospel, it feels like they have rejected us. When people ignore Jesus, it feels like Jesus is not in control. When people reject the power of the gospel, it feels like Jesus has lost his power. But prayer restores their perspective so they have comfort that he is in control and it gives them confidence to ask for big, bold prayers like verse 29. Verse 29, And our Lord, consider their hearts and grant your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Did you notice they didn't ask for safety or the opposition to end? They didn't ask for vengeance or judgment, but miracles of mercy. You see, if the sign gives an opportunity to share the gospel, they ask for more signs. They ask for more opportunities. They ask for boldness. And it's not a prayer that they would feel bold. It's a prayer that God, by his spirit, would make them bold. You see, if Jesus' mission is going to continue on earth, then the sufferings of Christ will continue in his people. In the face of opposition, the temptation is to change the message, or even worse, that we wouldn't speak at all, that we wouldn't share the saving message of Jesus. And so the disciples' prayer is a lesson for us to learn, that we too can pray for Rather than pray for comfort and security, pray for boldness. That God would give us the words to say, wisdom in when to say it, and boldness to share his saving message with people. So that we can continue being on Jesus' uh, mission together. So tonight, from the disciples, we learn, uh, the question is, how do we keep speaking to people about Jesus when they don't want to listen? Well, firstly, we don't change the message. We hold truth to the message of Jesus. Uh, And instead, we pray. We pray that God would be in control and we pray that God would give us boldness so that we can share his good news and we expect God to work, for God to transform lives, for God to win people to his salvation. So how about I finish tonight by praying that God would do that in us at church at 6.30 so that we can continue on being mission, on Jesus' mission together. Now, I thought what I'd do is finish by praying actually the disciples' prayer for us. So please pray with me. Let's pray together. Master, You are the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of your father, David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that us, your servants, may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healings and signs of wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.